morning, we're going to have the worship time of living dangerously. Anybody remember to bring their cell phone like we talk? Everybody remember the conversation? <laughs> Have you ever wondered what God looks like? Seriously, have you ever wondered what God looks like? Is God this craggy face, albeit handsome, white bearded <laughs> image from Michelangelo? Or is God more of a mothering, wispy spirit who's hard to capture? Or has God something else entirely? Believe it or not, God has given us a number of clues, a number of clues in Scripture, especially in the actions of the early church from the book of Acts. God's given us some clues. And believe it or not, we do know what God looks like. We absolutely know the face of God. We really do. Our still speaking God has even given us the blessing of more clues through modern technology, like the cell phone, to focus the picture just a little better. What am I talking about? Consider for a moment, how in this technological age that we live in, how our use of gadgets and new media seems to add a new word almost weekly to our common vocabulary. It wasn't too long ago that the term selfie didn't even exist. But today, everyone Everyone from teenagers, I'm sure Jane could probably testify to this with Brennan, from teenagers to presidents to popes and Hollywood celebrities, they're all mugging for their cell phone cameras and posting images for the whole world to see. Now, if you're still not sure what I'm talking about, and I can see a few blank looks out there, and that's okay. They're there was a time when I said, why, huh? <laughs> I want to demonstrate. So, get your smiley faces going. And stay with me, because I'm not the most adept at this. Who wants to be in a selfie? How about this crowd right here? Let's see if we can do this. Now, first, since it's a selfie, I've got to get in here, too. All right. So we're going to try it kind of. There's a little bit. Let's try that one. Got it. How about over here? You guys hold it out. Hold it out. <laughs> There's always a smart one in every class. But thank you for that tip. All right, here we go. Just a couple of more. All right, one more. Now, if you brought your own cell phone, take it out, click on camera, scoot next to a couple people next to you, and take the selfie, and then send it to me, and we'll try to get it up on the website. I want to get the power row back here. Turn around, Ruth. Quick gab and turn around. All right. All right. Now I'm going to give this, I'm going to give my phone to Lou because it takes a Boeing engineer to figure some of this stuff out. Oh, somebody's even got a tablet up. All right.
Now once you have your, self, your selfies taken, just kind of hold on to them and after, after church, later on today, send them to me and we'll get them up on the, on the website. And pretty soon St. John will be viral. The whole world will know who you are. I can see I've created a monster here. <laughs> but have you noticed, what's the first thing you do with, with a selfie? Yeah, there is a way to do this. You post it, you share it. I'm not sure what it is. You want to share them right away. Nobody I know takes selfies to hoard them like a coffee table scrapbook that you only pull out on special occasions. It's natural to want to share. Look at me. This is who I am. These are my friends. See what I'm doing today. By the grace of God, we are all social creatures. And over time, these selfies, as your photo album begins to build up in your phone or your digital camera, become like the mosaics of our life. You know, we know what a mosaic is. It's thousands of little stones of different colors. And when we bring our faces up to the mosaic, we can see the beauty of each stone or each photograph. But when we step back, we can see that the stones reveal, just like the pictures, a more beautiful picture, a more all-encompassing picture of life. Much like a digital photo album shows us what life and community is all about. A similar phenomenon occurs in the book of Acts. My phone may talk to us in the middle of the show. <laughs> the book of Acts where we experience the dramatic story of first century believers coming together as the church. Acts is an important book of the Bible, as I said just a little while ago. It's the only book in the Bible, the only one, that connects all the dots together. Connects hey! Wouldn't you know, a Boeing engineer would get it upside down. Yeah, that would be the pastor shot it upside down. Put another one up there. But you get the idea. But if you do this. Whoa. All right, settle there. The book of Acts connects all the dots of our faith story. What it is the upside down kingdom. <laughs> That's right, thank you. <laughs> when God came, he turned everything upside down. And this is the result. What do I mean by connect the dots? In one sweeping declaration from Peter in our reading today, Old Testament prophecy, the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry, the sacraments that he gave us that we still bear witness to, baptism and the Eucharist, and the identifying marks of God's ongoing church, they all combine into one larger picture of God himself, or God herself. We know where we fit in God's picture of creation through the book of Acts and how everything comes together. And connecting the dots of our faith matters because all of us, all of us tend to compartmentalize things too much. We have a silo mentality, if you will. We sometimes go through the motions of faith without fully understanding how what we do is part of a larger tapestry of God's continuing creation story. As Mike alluded to last week, when we see the larger picture, we see that Jesus is more than a dusty name from long ago. Baptism and Eucharist are more than quaint rituals. And the church more than a private club with questionable relevance in today's world. 
understand how all these pieces connect and fit together. We must first imagine ourselves back in the springtime of Pentecost, as the Hebrew people descended into Jerusalem to remember that time when Moses received the law of God on Mount Sinai. Except this time, this annual festival was different. For the whole town, everyone, was talking about this itinerant prophet from Galilee who had been crucified by the Romans as a common criminal. He had managed to arrive from the grave three days later to be seen by hundreds of people, not a few. Scripture tells us over 400 over a period of 40 days. Traditional Jews just could not believe that this was the long for Messiah. Yet people of the way, as this new movement was called, were growing in number. And the Romans who were assigned to keep order in Jerusalem during the time of Pentecost were just plain nervous. It was a turbulent time. Things were upside down. I guess we gave up on it. People didn't know who they were anymore. They didn't know what to believe. And their individual and communal identity had been turned upside down by these stories of a resurrected Messiah. Into this chaotic atmosphere, this buzz buzz of what's going on? What do you know? What do you hear? Steps Peter, the de facto leader of this budding movement who as an eyewitness to the resurrection proclaims the divinity of Jesus as the one foretold by the prophets, connecting that first dot. And then in a declaration that only someone who had denied Jesus three times could make, Peter declares that this Jesus, whom you crucified, stands ready to forgive and offer new life. If, if only you will repent and be baptized, the promise of salvation not only for those who are within earshot, but for their children as well, and their children's children. It was an invitation that stands today as an invitation to sinful people, that's us, to know a grace that is far stronger than even the greatest of sins. It's an invitation to a radical change of heart. Scripture is not a, oh, let's keep calm, avoid controversy, tiptoe through life so we can make it to the goal on the other end. Scripture is a radical document. It's one that speaks directly to one of the great mythologies of our age. That is the notion that our faith is a private matter. It should be kept just to oneself. The witness of the early church was anything, anything but private. If solitary belief were the essence of knowing God, and that's all you had to do, then the faith that built the Church of Jesus Christ for over 2,000 years never would have sustained itself beyond the first generation. Who would know? Who knows? How would they know? So we look at this remarkable scene from Acts where 3,000 people in one day committed to a radical new lifestyle of living together in community. The story gives us an opportunity to reframe our image of God. When we were born through baptism into a new life in Christ, joined to the body of the church, we are transformed in a way that allows us to truly see God's selfie. And yes, God has taken a selfie. And that selfie is called Jesus Christ.
who is God's self-portrait. An Instagram shot of what God is like. A visual representation that answers the question. If God were to be visible and active on earth, what would that look like? It would look like Jesus Christ. But then Jesus also did a selfie. What do you think that selfie is? It's called the church. What would it look like if Jesus were active today, alive today, and active in the world? It would, or should, look like the church. The church is Jesus' selfie. There's a mirror in mirror thing going on here. We in the church, this collected body of believers, are Jesus' selfie. We show the world what Jesus looks like. We show the world what Jesus looks like and we provide an affirming welcome to all who seek to join our community. You're welcome here, no matter who you are. When we, we affirm and show the face of Jesus when we reach out in love to the less fortunate, especially the less fortunate children in our community. When we seek strategic partnerships, as we're now doing with other groups who share our passion for the common good. When we take meals to those who need our love and support, we show the face of Jesus. When we say no to the violence of our gun-sated culture, we show the face of Jesus. When we stand up against injustice anywhere and everywhere, we show the face of Jesus. When we simply love more and judge less, we show the face of Jesus. We show the face of Jesus, who is the very face of the living God. You want to see God? Turn and look around you. Look around you. When the God in me sees the God in you, we can all see the face of the one who calls us forward to show hope to a wanting world. Get the picture? <laughs>